Good morning. So several years ago, my wife Amy and I found ourselves in one of those seasons where we were feeling a little bit disconnected. And uh, if you're a married couple, you can probably relate to this, that every once in a while, life just gets really crazy. And it seems like most of your conversations start dealing with what bills need to be paid, what decisions do we need to make, uh, what's the kids' schedules this week. And it's easy to fall into this season where you, you go into like, we call it roommate mode, where you feel more like business partners than marriage partners. And Amy is really good at sensing when we're heading down this path. And she's also really good at being intentional about scheduling time together so that we can reconnect and feel connected. And so she made me aware of this. And she also made me aware that she was feeling a little bit frustrated with me because the burden of this always seemed to fall on her. And there was kind of a lack of planning on my part for, for reconnection. And so I received this really well. And I said, I, I, I can probably come up and, and make a plan for something to do. And so a couple days later, Amy came home from work and I said, great news. I've got something planned for tonight. We are doing an escape room. Okay, yeah, cool, right? I thought, I thought it was cool. But when you're disconnected, uh, <laughs> might not be the best choice. And Escape rooms are more fun with more people. So I reached out to uh, some friends of ours. I said, there's another couple that's joining us. We're gonna meet them there. It's gonna be fun. And so we, we get to the place, we get out of our car, and we notice that the other couple is kind of in the same season because they're also fighting. So we've got two couples not getting along, doing a high pressure thing. So we walk in and, and here's what the escape room looks like. Now, I, I didn't do a lot of research. There's different themes you could do. I just picked one in the drop-down box, and they told us that the one I had chosen was airplane hostage situation, <laughs> okay? And to set this up, they bring us into this first room, and, and they tell us, we're going to handcuff you to each other, <laughs> all right, and put black bags over your head and walk you into the actual cabin of the airplane, and that's where you'll start. Now, to, to give you an idea of how well we were all getting along, uh, our wives refused to be handcuffed to their husbands. <laughs> so we got handcuffed to the opposite spouse, okay? <laughs> so we walk in, and then it's all black, and we have to feel around to find the key to unlock just to start this thing. Now, I, can't, I, I really can't remember if we made it out of the game alive, but we barely made it out of the actual in real life alive. It was, and by the end, it was so ridiculous that we were all belly laughing. And so I kind of figure like, who's the real brilliant person here when it comes to marriage counseling, right? Like that just totally reconnected us. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there are some adventures in your life that you would not mind missing out on. And there are other adventures that you would never want to miss out on. And here's what I believe. I believe that God has an amazing adventure planned for each and every single one of us. And I believe that he's placed unique gifts inside each of us to help unlock that adventure for us. And if we don't discover those giftings, then we could miss out on God's best for us. What undiscovered gifts might you have in you? What adventure might God have waiting for you? Now, as it turns out, there's a person in the Bible who had an incredible faith adventure. In fact, he wrote a lot of the books in the Bible that we read, and his name is Paul. And we're gonna take a look at a passage of one of the books that Paul wrote that provides some insight on living in a way that leans into God's adventure. So we're gonna take a look at the book of Ephesians, which is actually a letter that Paul had written to the church in Ephesus. And what's unique about this letter, Paul wrote multiple letters, what's unique about this one is this one summarizes the whole gospel and how it can reshape every part of our story. And if you could write one letter to your children and your grandchildren, and you could include your most cherished beliefs in it, this is that letter from Paul. This is Paul's version of that. And so we're gonna jump into Ephesians chapter five, verses 15 through 21. 
He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, there's two helpful things as we read this. Uh, the first thing you'll notice as we go through this, Paul uses a lot of contrasting language. We'll see that over and over in this passage, and that's helpful for us. And the second thing is, if you read those verses in the Greek, 15 through 21, it's actually one sentence. It's all one sentence. As we read it now, it's broken up into multiple sentences. But for Paul, this was one sentence, one concept. It was all cohesive. So let's unpack this a bit. Verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So the first thing that we learn from Paul is to make the most of every opportunity. And it's helpful to know who Paul was talking here uh, because of his use of language. Paul established this church in Ephesus on his third missionary journey, and he stayed with this church longer than any other church. He was with them for about three years, so he knew this group of people really well. And Ephesus was the most important commercial center in the Roman province of Asia. It was a major port city. And a lot of the people that Paul was talking to were merchants. And so the, his use of language here really resonated with them, making the most of every opportunity. And that would translate to liberate the time or redeem the time or redeem the moment. And this made a lot of sense to them. And so Paul's encouraging these merchants and us as the reader to take the opportunity from what it is and move it to something better in the kingdom. Take it from, it is, from what it is to what it could be. Now, I think this is really easy for us. We understand the idea of making the most of the opportunity when it's something fun, right? Uh, when my family is able to take a trip to Disney, we make the most of it. We're there when, when Mickey Mouse opens up the front gates, we're like the first ones in, and we stay as long as we can. We run around the park to hit every ride. And back in the day when they had extended hours till 2 a.m., we were there until the guests, the cast members were like, okay, time to go now, time to go. We would make the most of it. But Paul is saying, don't just make the most of the good opportunities, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So we can redeem the bad situations as well. And then Paul continues, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And the next thing we learn from Paul is obedience, following the Lord's will, obedience begins our adventure. And we can see that contrasting language here. Foolishness, trying to do things on our own, and wisdom, seeking the Lord's will, obedience to the Lord's will. We aren't always going to have all the answers, and sometimes we'll face situations that, that just aren't clear or don't make any sense to us. About six years ago, um, Amy was feeling really prompted to serve the, serve the homeless in Rochester. And so she, she went on the internet and, and found some different places that we might be able to do that and made some phone calls. And so we connected with one, this, this house, and um, we just asked, what do we need to do? And they said, well, well, if you come at this time and bring all the food, we'll have about 75 homeless people who come through and you can serve them. And so we called up a bunch of our friends and we made a bunch of food and brought it and were able to, to serve them. And one of the last families that came through, they were a unique family because they were the only family who had a, a child with them. And that really kind of um, touched our hearts to see a, a child in this sort of situation. And a um, little redheaded boy, he was about four years old, and uh, his name was Logan. And we started talking to them and, and heard their story. They, they, they had a house at one point that had a fire and they lost 
absolutely everything, like birth certificates, everything was gone. And so they had been living in a tent and uh, a storm came through and blew away the tent. And so now they were in the Cadillac Hotel. And um, so we, we just connected with them and our friends and uh, found out that they, they really had like two backpacks with them and that's it. So we got them some extra food and supplies and stuff like that and dropped it off for them. And this started a relationship with them. And over the next two years, we would kind of check in with them and touch base, see how they're doing, drop off things that they needed. And we started bringing Logan with us to sports camp and events at church. And uh, I remember we took him out for his fifth birthday. His, his birthday was the same day as Hannah's, our oldest daughter. And he wanted to see Lego Batman, so it was his first time in a the theater. And this relationship continued. And... Um, and then there was a season where we didn't hear from them for about three months. And I can remember, um, it was a Friday afternoon, I was sitting in my office and I got a phone call here at church and it was the dad. And so Logan had his parents, his dad was legally blind, his mom was in a wheelchair, her right leg was amputated. And uh, the dad said, um, I gotta be honest, um, we lost our apartment again and we've been living in an abandoned house in the city. And Logan and I, Logan and him were, were climbing into a window when a, a police officer saw them and notified CPS. And obviously this isn't a great situation for him, so they, they came and took Logan. And he asked me, he said, could your family take in Logan? We've got nobody. And so, Amy and I were um, just facing this crazy situation where um, like we've got three kids and if you know our kids, they're crazy and we've got a lot on our plates and uh, we contacted the CPS agent and they said uh, the way Logan had been living for the last months, they labeled him as feral. He didn't know how to use uh, a fork and knife. Um, they were in a house with no running water so he didn't know how to use a, a bathroom and it was not a good situation. And, uh, and then the dad said, by the way, family court's on Monday, so you've got till then to decide. So we spent a lot of time in prayer and just felt like God impressed it on our hearts to bring this little boy into our home. And um, that kind of started our Logan adventure. And I, I wanna share one funny story. So, I can remember a couple weeks in, we're sitting around our dining room table, we're having lunch, Amy had made sandwiches for everybody, and somebody said the word mercy just in the middle of their conversation, and Logan perked up and he said, mercy, you know House of Mercy? And we're like, what's, what's House of Mercy? He's like, we're, you stand in line and they give you food. We're like, oh, okay. And he said, yeah, they make really good sandwiches. They're better than your sandwiches, Amy. <laughs> So apparently homeless kids would rate House of Mercy food over my wife's food. <laughs> but that started our adventure and that, that took some obedience because that was really a, a scary situation for us. And then Paul continues in this passage with something that seems almost out of place. <clears throat> he says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. And so why does Paul seem to change direction and start talking about drinking wine here? And here's what I think Paul is saying. He's contrasting drinking too much wine with being filled with the Spirit. And he's letting us know that all of us are going to be filled with something. And we have the choice as to what we're gonna be filled with. And the point is that our choices impact our adventure. And so it's possible to fill ourselves up with things that medicate us or numb us, things that help us try to avoid the situation we're in or forget what's going on, or we can choose to be filled with the Spirit. And whatever our choices are, there's going to be fruit that comes from those choices. And the challenge with this is that it's, it's not just choosing between bad things and God's things. We also have to choose between good things and God's things. 
we're gonna find that we constantly have to push back against things as, in this world. We have to say no to some things so that we can experience the best that God has for us. And that's why I love seeing so many families who come here uh, like during the school year to our midweek program. Because I know how hard it is as a parent to get home from work, quick feed all the kids, try to take care of some of the homework, get things ready for the next day, and then race back to church. But that allows your kids to be in an environment where they get filled up spiritually. And on weekends, Sunday mornings, there's a lot of things that are just begging to fill up our schedule. And sometimes we have to say no to those things so that we can get in an environment where we're connected with a spiritual community like this. Are there good things in your life that are getting in the way of the best things that God has in store for you? In verse 20 we read, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1728, William Law wrote, a serious call to a devout and holy life which became one of the greatest classics to devotion on devotion to Christ of all time. And I want to read a quote from that because I think it applies so well. He, William says, if anyone would tell you the shortest, surest way to all happiness and all perfection, they must tell you to make a rule to yourself to thank and praise God in everything that happens to you. It is certain that whatever seeming calamity happens to you, if you thank and praise God in it, you turn it into a blessing. If you could work miracles, therefore, you could not do more for yourself than by this thankful spirit. It heals and turns all that it touches into happiness. And so gratitude not only leads to happiness, gratitude can expand our adventure. And we see so many great examples of this in scripture. Daniel was born into a noble life, but he was exiled and cut off from his family, yet he continually thanked God. And we see that Daniel would pray three times a day at his window. And this actually landed him in a lion's den, which was quite an adventure for him where God shut the mouths of the lions. Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, and he could have easily sulked inside the fish, but we see that he repented and gave thanks to the Lord. And shortly after that, the fish spit him up on the shore where he went on to preach in Nineveh. Hannah desperately wanted a child, and when God blessed her with a son, Samuel, she chose the giver over the gift. She loved Samuel, but she worshiped God and gave thanks to him. And we see this in Jesus' life as well, where preaching to 5,000 hungry people, he took five loaves of bread and two fish, and he gave thanks to God before there was enough. And then they distributed it, and there was 12 baskets left over. Gratitude has a way of redeeming the moment, and gratitude can expand our adventure. And in verse 21, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And the truth is, our adventures are not always easy. And there's a thing that happens when things get challenging we tend to focus on ourselves in those moments. But God's adventure for you is bigger than just you. And when we submit to God and we submit to others, it allows us to refocus our adventure. In the movie Top Gun Maverick, Lieutenant Pete Mitchell finds himself in a situation where he's training a bunch of elite pilots on a mission, and this mission seems like it has near impossible odds. Even if they complete this mission, they likely won't make it out alive. And Maverick knows that accomplishing, uh, finishing this mission is so important because so many lives are at stake for the mission. But he's willing to submit for the good of the mission to save the lives of others. Now I realize that was a spoiler, but I don't apologize. <laughs> I don't. If you have not seen the movie, it's one of the best movies ever made. You should have watched it by now. <laughs> but sacrifice is at the heart of submission. And no one knows that better than Christ, who gave his life on the cross for you and for me. 
And our adventures are not always going to be easy. But Jesus promises that we'll never be alone. And his desire is that no one would be disconnected from his love and his grace. And here's my last point, and if, if we could have the worship team come out. Your adventure is often someone else's rescue. Your adventure is often someone else's rescue. So, getting back to Logan. Logan lived with us for, for almost a full year. And during that time, we had friends in our life who, who purchased a bed for him that we were able to put in our, our finished basement for him to have a little bedroom. We had friends who bought clothes for him and gave him clothes and all kinds of supplies. And there were so many people we discovered in Logan's life who invested in him to make a difference. And uh, during his time with us, I can remember sitting in the old sanctuary. Uh, there was a morning where we had communion. And Logan celebrated communion with us as Amy whispered into his ear what that symbolized. And we had lots of bedtime prayers, reading out of the Jesus Storybook Bible, and just planting seeds in his heart. And we fully thought that God was calling us to bring Logan into our family forever. And, he, and then God started telling us something different. And he said, you're just a piece of Logan's adventure, but we've got something else for him. And he called us to let Logan move on to a new family. That was one of the hardest things for us to go through. But God had something in store for Logan, and shortly after leaving us, he was adopted into a wonderful family. And I have no doubt that someday, Logan's gonna be a part of a God's family as well. And here's the thing, having that little boy in our, our home, it wasn't just an adventure for him, it was an adventure for us. And you don't go through God's adventures without being changed. We learned so much from him. We learned so much. And the thing about God using you and someone else's adventure is that it has a ripple effect, it has a way of, of just sending his grace out and touching so many people. This Wednesday, we're starting Adventure Camp. And we have almost 200 kids registered to come into this facility. And just this incredible volunteer team ready to invest in those kids. And this message about adventure isn't just a one-time message for me. This is the heart of our children's ministry. I firmly believe that God has an adventure for every single one of us. And I want every one of our kids to know that and discover that. And I want every one of you to know that God has an incredible adventure for you. Would you bow your heads with me? What moments in your life right now can be redeemed or rescued? What prompting are you sensing that could lead to your next adventure? What things do you need to say no to in order to say yes to what God has in store for you? In your most challenging times of life, what gratitude can you discover? What might God be asking you to sacrifice in order to impact the lives of others? And whose life may change forever because you leaned into God's adventure? Father, you are so good. And we thank you that you desire the best for us 
and you have a plan for each and every one of us, Lord. Give us hearts that are sensitive to your voice, your promptings, and courage and trust to lean into that. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and worship with me?